Are you a warrior? Maybe you're easily stressed. Are you quickly negative? What about kind of pessimistic? Are you somewhat of a doomsdayer? Well, guess what? You don't have to be. Fear doesn't have to win all the time. Face it with us. Let's learn how to deal with it all. Living fearless. So we have journeyed through fear. We have talked about the fear of imaginary things and with a great green monster. We have talked about the fear of, of somebody finding us out. We've talked about the, the, the fear of mattering. We've, we've talked about things one after another, and we've talked about how fear can rule our lives. So we come tonight to the final chapter of fear. And to me, I will tell you it is something that can be the most powerful chapter written. Are you ready for the title? It's the fear of hidden junk. How many people have things in their closet that they don't want nobody else to see? Now, I'm talking about really your closet, but I may also be talking about that figurative closet in your life. How many people have things hidden back in their life or in their closet ain't nobody really ever needs to see? And the phone rings. Hey, let me, I'm going to jump into an illustration real quick. It's just, <laughs> I'm so excited I'm just jumping into it. Yeah, the, ha, ha, anybody in here ever had to deal with a bill collector? Somebody's telling a story up in this room. <laughs> so, li, listen, have you, have you ever accidentally answered the phone and go, whoa, I didn't mean to do that? Have you ever avoided somebody because of a question they may ask? Have you ever done anything wrong in your life and then you are so afraid that somebody is going to call you on it that you avoid somebody else? I'm just guessing that I'm not the only one in my life who has dealt with hidden junk. I don't know, maybe, maybe we need to turn the table. Has anybody in here not dealt with hidden junk in their life? <laughs> See, they didn't want to admit it then, did they? They weren't saying amen in the beginning, but they were there. Hidden junk. Hidden junk. So the way tonight's going to go is really simple. It's three pages of notes and one illustration. Couldn't be more simple, but couldn't be more powerful. I really don't think that this topic hit me as hard as it ever has until these past few weeks. My life lately has been an absolute blur. Busyness doesn't even begin to describe me, and it's really nothing I've done. It's a, it's a blessing that God has given me. I've done tons of things. I've spoken to tons of people. I've even got a ton of things done, but it's all been a blur the last few weeks. The roots of this message tonight actually found its, its genesis, if you will, in, in this last big project I was a part of. We had already been asked by the city to help relocate 21 families and households from Magnolia Apartments. We were in talks with the city. We were in talks with social agencies, and we were the negotiating piece in between them. And that prayer that we pray every single Sunday that I'm up here praying over offering that God will somehow use us to transform this community, it was finally coming true. God was answering that prayer. It is no question that Church on the Rock's role has been absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely vital in this relocation project. 
there is no doubt in my mind that the volunteers that came and gave of their time day after day as we tried to work through this mess, as they went and met people with love, as they grabbed a hold of people who were not very lovable, and they held on to them, and they treated them with respect and dignity. It's no doubt that that will be a turning point in many people's lives. It is no doubt in my mind that had Church on the Rock not stepped in, there would be a group of individuals that would have a much tougher hill to climb and a much tougher life to live even this week. But, turn to your neighbor and say but. Something started nagging me when myself and Church on the Rock began getting compliments and we started getting accolades in the community. I was sitting down when this thought first came to my head. <coughs> a great friend of mine, y'all know him, uh, Keith Del Cambria at Bozo's, was being honored at the YMBC ball. I'd never been to a ball. I've lived here a dozen years, never really done anything with it. And so he invited me to sit at his table. He was going to be a duke. I was excited. He means the world to me. That family means the world to me. And so I'm sitting there. I'm looking around. It was absolutely beautiful. I'd never seen anything like it. The decorations, gorgeous. The food, oh my gosh, it was awesome. The costumes, absolutely beautiful. The food, man, more than I could handle. The music, it was terrific. The food, let me tell you, it was just all over the place. <laughs> it was over the top. And how many people in this room know that sometimes God will drop something in your soul? And he did. And here's what he dropped in my soul. That Friday... I went from serving people that did not have food in their refrigerator to sitting at a table with people who would be throwing food away. It tore me up. It was in that minute that God opened up my eyes to what was really happening. And in, the kids will certainly get this reference, a very real-to-life Hunger Games episode. We were living it. There were those without and those with too much. And my mind jumped over to this verse in Philippians. I once thought that these things, they're valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done for me. My eyes had been pointed at the glittery and the glamorous and looking at the wrong place. These things that I thought were valuable, the pomp, the circumstance, the seeing people and the being seen, I once thought that was great and grand, and all of a sudden, it came to a screeching halt when I realized it meant nothing in comparison to Christ and what he did to me. My mind fast-forwarded from Philippians 3 over to Revelation 3. And Jesus is writing a letter to the church of Sardis. And here's what he said, listen, because I have this feeling that I'm not the only one who has lived this life. He said, I know all the things that you were doing. You have a reputation for being alive, but you're dead. I see your reputation. 
Your rep reputation is beautiful. It's great. The community loves everything you're doing, but Jesus looks on the inside and sometimes when he sees on the inside doesn't line up with what's been projected on the outside. And at heart. Here's Jesus, the son of the living God, and he's saying you've got this great reputation, Church on the Rock, of doing great things in this community, but I know the truth, and the truth is some of us in this church are dead. What you did was great, but in the grand scheme of things without Jesus, it's nothing. Jesus, the one who went to the cross, Jesus, the one who rose from the dead, he looks down and he looks in our lives, he looks past the works that we do, and he says, I see into your heart, and your heart says a much different story than is written on your face. There's something more important. There is something actually more important than feeding and housing. It's Jesus. It's sharing Jesus. Don't forget about Jesus. It's not enough for us to be known in this city as just the church that does great things. At some point in our life of this church, we have to move beyond an event-based church to a relational-based church that is about love. We have to to get what's inside right with God. We have to be about the personal relationship. We have to be about repentance. I know that's a bad word, but somewhere in the gospel message coming from this pulpit, we have to talk about repentance that turning away from this world and running strong into God's arms, repentance. We have to revive that old word that we used to hear in church called purification. Cleaning up our lives. And it's not because we're better than anyone else. It's not because I'm better than anyone else. In fact, no, it's the complete opposite. It's a, that's why Paul in Philippians 3, just past the verse that we started with, he continued on. Listen to these verses. He said, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved perfection, but rather I possess this, I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved this. I've not done this, I've not gotten this, but this one thing that I focus on, this one thing, I forget my past. I look forward to what lies ahead and I press on to reach the end of the race and to finally reach that heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us to. It's about the relationship. I believe that Jesus is saying to this church, and I think that he is saying to the church in Sardis, everyone thinks you guys are doing very well. You look to be so alive. You look like you're on fire for Jesus, but you need to know that I'm looking at you and I'm not looking at the works done. I'm looking at your heart. Church on the rock has to move beyond good works and a good reputation that we're putting out to the community and start putting forth love and demonstrating that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message. We have to deal with the sin in our life. I'm reminded, David, when he penned this out of Psalms 139, he said, oh Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything about me, Lord. You know when I sit down and you know when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and you see me when I'm at rest at home. 
You know everything I do, O Lord. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it. He knows us. He knows us. And it's like God Almighty is looking down at us and saying, church on the rock, I know the truth. And I'm more interested in a relationship. Stop worrying about your reputation. Stop worrying about your reputation. Stop worrying about what other people say. Stop worrying about what other people think. Get the relationship right, Church on the Rock. Get the relationship. You get the relationship right, then the reputation just takes care of itself. I believe it is a calling from God. I believe this is a day for repentance. It's not that the works are bad. They're not. These works should be done. Don't don't misinterpret me. I'm not saying don't do the works. I'm saying make sure that we have our priorities right and the relationship is above the reputation. It is so easy to pretend something we're not. And what we end up with is just someone with a good reputation and a hollow shell. Here's a quote for you. We communicate to people what we want them to think we are. We communicate to people what we want them to think we are. That's what was happening at Sardis. Man, they were on fire. Everybody looked at them and said, man, you're a church. You're moving and shaking. You're doing this, you're doing this, you're doing this. But God looked at them and said, yeah, but there's a, can you, uh, nah, you're dead. They had a great reputation of works, but they were lacking the personal relationship. Here's a question. If I went to your friends and I asked them, tell me, tell me about Ann. Ann, if I went to your friends, tell me about Ann. And then I went to God and somehow had this great conversation with God and I said, now God, tell me what you know about Ann. What about you? If I ask your friends who you are and I ask God who you are, if there is a difference between the two, then there is unresolved business in your life. If what God says is different than what our friends say, then we are no better than Sardis. Let me say this. I have this in bold letters on my thing. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm really not. I'm not interested in anybody feeling guilty. I, I don't believe in that. Repentance has nothing to do with guilt. It, it doesn't. It, God's not interested in making you feel guilty. God's interested in you making a decision. I'm just telling you that God used this event and the compliments that came from it to begin showing me that I had things in my life that needed to be taken out not because he's interested in me feeling bad, but rather because he wants me to be more like him. David wrote this in Psalms 51. You'll you'll recognize some of these verses. He says, purify me from all my sins. I will be clean then. Wash me, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me, so now let me rejoice. David is crying out these words. Don't keep looking at my sins, O God. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew this right spirit within me. Don't banish me, Lord. Don't banish me from your presence. Oh, but Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David is crying out in this point, and he's looking, and he's saying, I, God, you're, 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 the kingdom, it's growing, but there's still something in me that's not right, and I have to get it right. God, will you help me get it right today? And I heard 
those compliments that we've been given. And I don't know about you, but for me, I had to deal with some very serious struggles. I've had to bow down to the sin of pride and repent in ways that I could have never imagined. I've had to bow down and repent from the self arrogance and self-control where I thought I did it myself. I've had to bow down and I had to repent for these things where I thought it was about us and about a reputation. I had to bow down and repent to Jesus and say I was in the wrong. It's not that God isn't using us. He is. He's using us, I believe, more than anyone else. I got that. But it's about us making sure we have the right attitude while he's doing it. He wants us to grow closer to him. And so I'm landing with this. And I really, I hate to ask you this question. But if you're honest with yourself and you were to close your eyes and do a personal inventory of yourself, are there things in your life that need to be purged out? Are there things in your life where you have been more concerned about your reputation or even the church's reputation? Are there things in your life where you're more worried about what somebody else thinks than what God is thinking? Are there things in your life that you wanna just enjoy rather than to surrender? If so, I wanna tell you God is calling you tonight to repair the relationship and to forget about your reputation. How about this question? If no one else was around you right now, and it's just you and God, that's it. We emptied out this entire room, and you're standing in front of God. What is the thing in your mind that you're going to ask him to help you with? That's where God wants to begin tonight. I'm gonna close with this illustration, and I'm gonna leave you alone. I will tell you this, that God delivered this to me as a message, not to the church, although I think this is a message for the church. We had, uh, I had been here at Church on the Rock um, uh, probably, I don't know, three years, a couple, three years. And uh, I was speaking at the youth I don't even think, I know we weren't, we weren't doing youth at that time. Erica and Jared and I weren't doing youth. Um, I'm thinking it was probably either when Christy was here, maybe, maybe when McCracken was here. And, and I talked about hidden sin. And I started asking the question, if, if, if you could push everything away, so that nobody is knowing what you're struggling with. What would you be, what would you be talking to God with? What would, you, what would you be asking him? Somebody stood up, and I, I don't remember who this is. I don't, uh, Sam may be old enough to remember. I don't remember who it was. Somebody stood up and said, uh, uh, well, last week I cussed twice. I wanted to kick him in the shin. <laughs> Somebody else stood up and said, I can't get over my addiction to pornography. Somebody else said, I absolutely hate my parents. What is so hard for us adults to do that? Why is it so hard? Our teenagers, I can sit in here, a room full of teenagers, 35 kids, 40 kids, 20 kids, ever how many we got, and I can ask them, hey, what's going on in your life? Man, they'll shoot up. They're gonna tell you everything there is. But we get our driver's license, 
we get that high school diploma, we pass 10 years to 20 years, and all of a sudden we are so concerned about reputation that we wouldn't dare share it. We wouldn't dare share what's going on in our mind. We're so convinced that we're the worst and the person next to us is the cleanest. So I did something. I took this paper. This is from that night, by the way. It's been in my office. I I don't throw it away. And I put it down the back wall. I took the little sheets of paper and I cut them out and I covered them up. And then I let kids, one by one, go up to that sheet of paper and they could write absolutely anything on there. I said, if God were to answer one of your prayers tonight, which one would you put up there? So I wanna read you some of their answers and see if any of them or maybe the same thing you're still struggling with. How about this one? I want my family to be happy again. Is anybody struggling with their family? Want to be happy again? If that's you, then you need to come to the altar. Not to show me, but to have that relationship with Christ. How about, how about this one? A kid saying, my family's finances. How about a kid who's smart enough to realize I need salvation? My family's having serious problems right now. Will you pray for them? Will people please stop being fake to me? My dad died. My grandmom has cancer. I've got storms. Hey, my grades. I need help with my grades. That's our number one prayer request in youth, by the way. My family's struggling and I need help. My friend's pregnant. She's 17. The baby's father is living in a different state. Won't answer the phone calls. Will you pray that the drama gets out of my house? Anybody in here have drama in your house? Our kids are raising their hands. I lost someone. God, will you forgive me? I'm scared my stepdad's in the Navy. Help my mom and dad get through their problems. I need you. So I guess the question is tonight, why can't we adults be this real? We've got hidden junk in our life. We look great. We've got the reputation. The city is proud of us. But Jesus wrote us a letter I said, but you still got stuff in your life I want to handle. Jesus is looking at you and he's saying, hey, I'm not trying to get you to feel guilty. I'm wanting you to feel revived. Revived. Again, we are incredibly glad that you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. 
encourage you to go to the website. There you can find any of our archive podcasts. You can send us an email about how God's working in your life or a prayer request. Or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Have a blessed day.